All right. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for coming. We're going to uh, go ahead and get started here. I know we're uh, running a little bit late, but uh, tonight we're on university time. <laughs> so I'm Doug Song, CEO and co-founder of Duo Security. Um, our normal host for tonight, uh, my co-founder and CTO, Dr. John Oberheide, uh, uh, was it adopted by aliens or men in black oh, helicopters? Right oh, you're right here. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, there you are. Hey, John. So tonight, your host will be Dr. John Oberheide. Apparently. And we'll tell you a little more about our speaker, who actually was a former Duo intern as well. Um, but we're very proud to have uh, such a close relationship to the, the community at the, at the University of Michigan. We're proud alumni ourselves. Go Blue. And um, we are, we'd lo we're looking to do more and more collaborations with uh, university folks. Um, with Duo Tech Talk, so you expect to see some more of these things in the future. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to John. Um, all right, let's see if I can manage all these microphones here. <laughs> so um, as many of you know, I'm not actually John Override, co-founder of Duo. Uh, if I were, I wouldn't be an underpaid university professor at the University of Michigan. I'm actually Alex Halderman. I recognize many, many of you from my security classes over the years that I, that I teach at U of M. Um, as many of you probably know, um, my research work in security in my group focuses on uh, real world attacks and defenses. And a lot of the work that we've done over the past few years has to do with uh, conducting internet wide measurements to understand threats and who they, uh, who they affect, and with studying the security of core um, internet cryptography, things like TLS and HTTPS. Um, it's a tradition in my group that um, the youngest student involved substantially in work gets to give the talk. And therefore, David Adrian uh, uh, is going to today present a, a variety of work that uh, is joined with many of our other students who are also here, including Eric Wustro, Zakir Darumarich, uh, Drew Springle, uh, Travis Binkenauer back there, um, and others. Um, David, I think, is um, particularly dear to people here at Duo because he um, used to work here until we hired him away from Duo and uh, back into um, a lowly paid PhD position. <laughs> but I'll let David give you some sense of why being a PhD student at Michigan is actually an awesome, awesome thing to do in security right now. Um, and uh, really, it's uh, a, um, a, a great pleasure to be able to uh, hand the microphone to David Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So yeah, as Alex said already, um, I'm David Adrian. I'm a graduate student at the university. Um, you might have noticed online that it did say that I was giving this talk with Zakir. Um, who's not actually giving it with me, but is right over there now. Um, he's luckily not on fire like he is here. Um, ask him about it later, or better yet, ask Alex about it. Um, OK, so what am I talking about? Um, talking about TLS, uh, transport layer security. Um, and I'm sort of going to go through uh, a few things. One, I'm going to like explain what it is, if you're not familiar. And then we're going to talk about the fun part, which is what happens when TLS fails. Um, as you might have noticed in the news or, or on Twitter, 
TLS fails a lot. In fact, it failed today with the latest OpenSSL vuln. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what can we do to, to prevent this in the future and, and show some work that our group has done um, to make TLS more secure for everybody. Um, and this is sort of the work with weak Diffie-Hellman and the logjam attack, which you might have seen recently. So TLS is a secure channel. Um, it provides a secure channel that other communication can be built on top of. Um, <coughs> so what I mean by secure channel is literally the network security. Um, when you're talking back and forth, two parties on the network, we're just going to concentrate on communication security. We're not going to be talking about application security, um, which is what I think most of the talks here, uh, here or many people here do. Um, we're going to be sticking on the lower level at, at the communication sort of network level. Um, and remember, communication security doesn't imply network security, or communication security doesn't imply application security, um, but it certainly is sort of a first step in getting there. Um, <coughs> And then uh, what I mean by uh, a secure channel is, is it's a channel uh, where you're talking over a network where you have confidentiality, meaning attackers can't read your messages. Uh, you have integrity, meaning attackers can't modify or resend any of your messages. And you have authentication, meaning you know who you're talking to. If you think you're talking to, uh, to John or, or to Doug, you know you're talking to John or Doug. Um, and then, of course, the obligatory slide that says TLS, SSL, these are essentially the same thing, um, different words for the same beast. Um, SSL technically was developed by Netscape way back in the 90s. Um, and SSL version 3.1 is really TLS version 1.0. Um, if you inspect the packets on the wire, that's what they actually say. Um, and then HTTPS is, of course, um, HTTP ran inside of TLS. Um, that's where the, the S for security in HTTPS comes from the TLS. So for the rest of this talk, um, I'm just going to say TLS unless I explicitly mean one or the other. Um, hopefully now that we're phasing out SSL v3, uh, we, these sort of TLS, SSL, which one am I going to say slides, can become less common. OK, so that's sort of the, the general space that we're working in. Um, what happens when TLS fails? So the most obvious example of TLS failing recently, oh, forgot to say, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. We have this clever box here that I can throw at you that has a microphone and you can ask me questions. I will probably miss, so really the person next to who's asking the question should probably <laughs> pay attention. Um, but yeah, so TLS failing. Uh, the most sort of public version of this recently was Heartbleed. It had a logo. It started the trend of, of assigning logos to vulnerabilities. Um, everybody loved it. It was in real people news. Um, <laughs> it was on the New York Times. Um, basically, it allowed attackers to dump private data from a server. You sent it an invalid packet, and the server would be like, hey, here's the stuff, and give it back to you instead of rejecting it. Um, <coughs> and this affected 24 to 55% of HTTPS servers. Um, so the way it worked was, uh, as usual, best explained by XKCD. Um, uh, there's this extension to TLS called Heartbeat. Um, and this is for if you're using uh, TLS over sort of a lossy connection, like a UDP connection, for example, um, you might not know if the server just disappeared or died or if the client died or lost his connection. So they added the ability to send keep alive messages. And the way these worked, is you would just send a message with some random data, and you'd say how long it was. It'd be like bird, four letters. And the server would send back, OK, there's four letters. Here's bird. Um, but it turned out you could also be like, uh, I'm going to send you this 500-letter word, hat. Um, and what you would get back is hat, and then 477, um, or 497 letters of, of random data from the server. Um, <coughs> And so this was an implementation bug. Um, it happens. Um, but can, can we learn more about TLS in general just f by studying Heartbleed itself? Um, and is there a way that we can actually figure out what its actual impact was? Like, sure, it was in the news. It had a logo. It was red. Red is bad. There used to be locks. Maybe now there's not locks. Um, the, the security, like, uh, what was the actual impact? Um, well, it turns out we can actually measure this um, and know this number. 
um, by using a tool developed in our lab called ZMap. Um, I'm not sure where Zakir went, um, but which is a common theme in our lab. Uh, but uh, Zakir developed ZMap originally back in 2013. Um, and what it does is it works sort of like NMAP. It's an open source network scanner. Um, but it can do an entire internet wide scan on a single TCP port um, in originally under 45 minutes, nowadays under five minutes if you have a good enough network connection. Um, I went ahead and made it a little faster last year. Um, and so what we do with it is we connect to literally every single HTTPS server on the internet. Um, and we'll do things like download their certificates or see if they're vulnerable to Heartbleed, um, for example. Um, so we modified ZMAP to be able to uh, detect if a server was vulnerable to Heartbleed. It turns out we had this nice trick where we could do this without actually exploiting the bug, so we didn't literally exploit every server on the internet. Um, uh, some people thought we did at first, um, <coughs> but we didn't actually. Um, and so, within 48 hours of disclosure, it would have been a little bit quicker, but I was a senior at the time and had homework. Um, <laughs> uh, we were scanning and, and, and collecting data on all of IPv4 uh, to figure out who was vulnerable, and we were also scanning uh, the Alexa top one million sites, which is a ranking of websites on the internet um, by popularity. And so we were scanning all of the most popular websites uh, every eight hours and doing 1% samples. Um, and so we posted all this data online, and it turns out it looks something like this. And so on here, we've got a vulnerability among Alexa top one million and against all IPv4. Um, so <coughs> interestingly, Alexa actually more vulnerable. So the most popular websites were more vulnerable than if you just took a random HTTPS server off the internet and checked to see if it was vulnerable. And the reason for this is actually pretty great. Um, it's because Alexa websites are kept up to date more often because they have sysadmins and they're for companies and people are employed. Your random HTTPS server on the internet is like 15 versions of OpenSSL back, so it's actually too old to be vulnerable. Um, so that's why it's lower. Um, you'll note that there's this giant drop down in the middle. Um, and actually a lot of the vulnerable servers uh, were in one network and belonged to a single hosting provider um, and they patched all of their boxes all at once. Um, so that was the giant drop there. Um, and while we were doing this, we also had a honeypot up on EC2 that was just serving a dummy website. Um, and we noticed that that site was, uh, yes? Who was that? Uh, the hosting provider? Yeah. Who was that? Uh, so to be honest, I don't remember the name of the provider. Uh, neither does Zakir. Um, it was, yes, it was a random one. It wasn't EC2 or anything like that. Um, yeah. Back? Sure. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, we had a honeypot uh, running a dummy website uh, that was explicitly, yeah, I should delegate this to my advisor. We'll let him do the throwing. Um, <coughs> Um, so, I think it's, dead. it's got a one-second it delay. Oh. Um, so the honeypot uh, started getting, we noticed that people were trying to exploit Heartbleed on it um, within 24 hours. And, and this website is, is pretty much nothing. Um, and so there's absolutely no reason to visit it ever. Um, and so anyone that was exploiting it was likely doing a sort of wide, large-scale scanning to try and find people who were vulnerable. And so they had an even better response time than us. Um, and most of the IPs we noticed were naturally coming from China. Um, I don't have one of Duo's attribution eight balls, but it was right on. Um, so we noticed that, well, we've been scanning the internet and we know everybody who's vulnerable. Why not email them and tell them? Um, so, uh, we did looked up who was records for um, everybody that was vulnerable and emailed them. Um, only two people threatened to sue us. Um, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> so we decided to attempt to do some science here. And so what we did was uh, on, we split the vulnerable people up into two groups. 
notified half of them, group A. Um, and then a week later, we notified group B. Um, and so the reason we did this was to see, was the group that, notified, uh, that got notified earlier, did they patch faster? And the answer is they patched 47% better. And we were like, holy crap, people actually read email. Um, <laughs> but apparently, if you get an email from a university that says, hey, Berkeley in Michigan, because um, we were collaborating with Berkeley on this, uh, say you're vulnerable to heart bleed, um, and you've seen heart bleed in the news, you do actually patch. Um, whether this will work for like a vulnerability that doesn't have a logo and, and wasn't all over the news uh, remains to be seen. Um, but we were really surprised by this. Um, and so luckily we were able to do some good, um, get, get people to start patching. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so that's an example of sort of how, how, to, how we can react to, to issues with TLS um, using measure, yes. So any thoughts around how fast the industry responded? Like how did Qualys do the scanning or Tenable do the scanning? Um, so Qualys, they had their tests up before we did. Um, I actually, whoops, I hit a button. Uh, okay. Um, So Qualsys, they had their tester up before us. I actually, um, one of the, that was one of the ways I worked on testing mine was by checking to make sure it had the same results of theirs. Um, but theirs is, right, you go to their website, you put in a domain, it scans it, tells you if it's vulnerable. Um, ours, on the other hand, we were just like, screw it. It turns out all websites fall under the set of everybody. Um, so uh, we just connected to everybody. Um, so sort of a different approach. Um, but they did have it done before us. There were people that had, I think, the top 10K before us. Um, who didn't have homework to do, I guess. Um, so, I think I keep hitting the wrong button. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, that was sort of reactive, like there, there is an implementation bug in TLS, we were able to react to it, do some good, but can, can we actually use these sort of measurement techniques and scanning to, to make TLS better in, in general um, and improve it for the future? And the answer is um, we can, and we published this giant paper about it with 14 co-authors from three different countries. Um, and so I'm sort of gonna jump into that now. Uh, but before we get into the details, um, we have to talk about Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, <coughs> so uh, Diffie-Hellman is a process for two people who are communicating on an insecure network to agree on a secure key without anybody else knowing what it is. Um, and Wikipedia has this diagram, and all of them are disappointed that I have this diagram up here because all paint does eventually combine to brown. Um, right. But... <laughs> right, people who understand math, like, you know, multiplication. It's okay, that's on the next slide. Um, <laughs> um, and so, so the basic idea here is, is, is we can take some sort of common set of values, we can pick some secret values, we can mix them together, um, to come up with a public value and then back calculate a shared secret. And so in more detail, let's say we have Alice, naturally, and Bob communicating over a secure channel, or a insecure channel, excuse me. Um, once again, we're gonna go with XKCD characters. Um, and for the common sort of set of parameters, uh, they're gonna use a, a really big prime number that we'll call P and a generator G. Um, and then they're gonna pick some secret numbers. In this case, Alice picks A, Bob picks B. Um, Alice raises the generator to the power of her secret number, modulus the prime number, so this is the, the mod operator here, um, the remainder. Um, and Bob likewise does the same with his secret number and sends it to Alice. And then at the end, they can both raise the other person's public value to their secret value, and this really just turns out to be both of them are calculating g to the ab, and this is a nice shared secret. Oops, hit one too many times. Um, because it turns out in cryptography, everything is actually just math. And so the value they're sharing here um, <coughs> is just this basic exponentiation. And the reason that this works is because of the mod p at the end. It turns out that the mathematicians tell us that if all I can see is this value and I wanna get the individual numbers in it, that that's just really freaking hard. Um, that you can do it, but it's going to take infeasibly long to calculate. 
Um, and if it's going too short, if you add four bits to P, it's going to take twice as long every time that you do that. Um, and so sort of conventional wisdom suggests you use prime numbers that are at least 2,048 bits long. But let's say you are trying to break it. If you were, you'd be using uh, this algorithm that a mathematician would be happy to explain called the number field sieve um, that can go back and calculate this discrete log. Um, and then we'll go through and calculate the shared secret. Um, but this isn't feasible for uh, the size primes that we're supposed to use on the internet. But it turns out that a group of academics, specifically um, some cryptographers that we collaborated with in France, um, can do this for prime numbers that are 512 bits long. And also that it turns out um, that, that uh, while well, the cryptographers realized this, but the people who were implementing systems didn't necessarily, that all of the math that you have to do to, to, to calculate the shared secret, 99% of it just depends on the prime number that you use. And then only a very tiny bit at the end actually depends on the, the specific key exchange you're trying to break. Can I interject really quickly yes. here with an apology? So for those of you in the audience who uh, uh, learned how Diffie-Hellman works from me, I apologize that I didn't teach you this fact about the cryptanalysis. Because basically nobody who did uh, security systems realized this very surprising fact. We thought that um, to break uh, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange modulo uh, some you know, P of a certain length, you had to do this very, very long computation. And it was OK if everyone used the same P. But it turns out there's a caveat to that, which is that almost all the work depends only on P and not on the specific value you're choosing. The cryptographers knew that. They didn't tell us. So that's why we didn't tell you. Well, if, if you ask a cryptographer if they told us, the cryptographers are like, we told you this. Why weren't you listening? Well, the, um, the, the cryptographers didn't realize we were all just using the same P's. Yeah. But so we'll David, get to David that. David will get to that. But I want to apologize personally to the people who I didn't teach this in so, back to. So we've sort of gone down this math tangent. Let's jump back to, to TLS. Um, so let's say you're connecting to a website like Duo, um, who I think recently improved their TLS to get an A plus on Qualsys. Good job, so I hear. Um, and also all caps. Um, nice big green lock, modern cryptography. Um, but there's, there's two things to note here. Um, first is right that, that websites have certificates, and that's how you authenticate them. These certificates contain a public key. You can get them for free from some people. You can pay for them from other people. Um, we're working on making that easier, but that's an entirely different talk. Um, but what's relevant to us in this case um, is the cipher suite. So TLS goes through this process when you start a connection called the handshake, where you negotiate a cipher suite, and a cipher suite defines the type of encryption and the type of key exchange that you're going to be doing. So you can see that the one here is using AES for encryption, and it's using something called uh, ECDHE for key exchange. Um, the type of key exchange that we're interested in is, of course, uh, Diffie-Hellman, um, specifically the ephemeral kind, um, often called DHE. All that really means is that we're doing a new one every time instead of storing some values. Um, so every time, in an, if you're negotiating with an ephemeral cipher, you do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So let's take a look at how that looks. Um, let's say we're doing Diffie-Hellman inside of TLS, and I'm some client talking to a server. I go and say hello. I send my cipher suites. The server's like, great. I see your cipher suites. It picks one, and it sends the selected cipher suite back, as well as its certificate. Um, client grabs that. Um, since we're using a ephemeral sort of Diffie-Hellman cipher, the server's going to go ahead and start doing Diffie-Hellman. So it's going to pick those two parameters I mentioned earlier, G and P, and send them over to the client. Um, it's also going to sign those parameters using the key in its certificate so that the client can verify them later. Um, then the client's going to get the parameters, be like, OK, this is the P that we're using, generate its own value, send it back. At this point, we're done with Diffie-Hellman. We're sharing keys. We can start doing encryption. Everything is great. And then we have this thing here at the bottom. Uh, an encrypted hash of everything that happened. And the reason that's there is to just double check that nothing was tampered with. Um, so we take the entire set of messages that were sent back and forth, and we hash them, and we send it back and forth. And the, uh, the, the hashes should be the same if both sides saw the same 
transcript, there's an attacker modifying messages, the hashes would be different, handshake would fail. Um, and the good news um, is that no one uses 512-bit primes. Surely no one must. Like, these are really short. We know that they're bad. Um, but unfortunately, there's also export ciphers. Um, so if you're not familiar, back in the 90s, during the crypto wars, it was illegal to use what was called strong cryptography um, exported outside of the United States because cryptography was classified as a munition. Um, and essentially what this meant was you couldn't use prime numbers bigger than 512 bits. Um, so uh, TLS was designed before this law was overturned. It was overturned in the case of uh, Bernstein versus United States of America. Bernstein here being DJB, if you've heard of him before. Um, TLS, the original version, was designed before this law was overturned. So it needed to compensate for the fact that if you were talking with a client outside the US, you couldn't use strong cryptography. So it included all of these things called export suites that used short keys. And the ephemeral version used 512-bit primes. We'll call these DHE export ciphers. Um, but hypothetically, this should be fine, because right, we have these ephemeral ciphers uh, and non-ephemeral ciphers that we're not really going to talk about that do Diffie-Hellman. And then we have all the export ciphers. And the export ones are bad, and the, Diffie and, and the non-export ones are good. And these should be largely separate. Um, but Sometimes this isn't the case. Sometimes these export ciphers can sort of sneak out of their hole where they're supposed to be isolated um, and start essentially screwing over people who are trying to use strong cryptography. Um, so that brings us to Logjam. Logjam was our, the latest TLS vulnerability until today. Um, we didn't have a logo for it, but uh, we, we proposed these two emoji um, for Logjam. Uh, <laughs> And so what it is, it's a downgrade attack against TLS, um, where you can trick a client into using uh, export grade cryptography if the server supports it. The client doesn't have to. Um, so let's go back and look at how that works. Um, so if you go to open clip art and look for hacker, you get the LulzSec logo. So, um, so once again, we have a client talking to a server, except this time there's a man in the middle. And so the client's going to send its nice list of strong cipher suites. And the server and the man in the middle is going to be like, screw that, and it's going to replace the ciphers with, with only export Diffie Hellman. And the server, um, because it was used with its default settings and you didn't change the ciphers, um, supports export grade cryptography. Why servers do this is still beyond me, but they pretty much all default to using every cipher possible, including really bad ones from the early 90s that you should never ever use. Um, and so the server, if it supported these ciphers, so it's like, okay, we're gonna use export cryptography. The man in the middle swaps it back again and tells the client, hey, we're using normal Diffie Hellman. The server goes and generates its parameters, but it's gonna generate really terrible ones because it thinks it's doing export grades. So it's gonna use a 512-bit tiny prime. Uh, the prime size isn't specified anywhere. It's been signed by the server, so the client's just gonna be like, whatever. I'm also gonna generate a 512-bit Diffie Hellman parameter. Who really cares? because nobody checked this length because no one thought to until now and it wasn't specified. So it sends back export grade Diffie-Hellman parameters. But now, um, so now the, the key exchange is finished. We haven't, the attacker didn't actually tamper with the key at all. Both clients agree on the same key, um, except right now the connection should fail, right? Because we did that thing earlier uh, where the next step is you're gonna hash everything and the hashes should be different. But if your attacker can break the 512-bit Diffie-Hellman, it's happy to fix up the hashes to either side and present different ones um, so that both sides um, seems to think, oh, okay, and it can do this. Um, this message is encrypted, but the attacker can break Diffie-Hellman because it was short, so it doesn't matter. And that's sort of the downgrade attack. Um, and it requires the server to support the export DHE. Um, but really, like, let's be honest, this requires doing the number field sieve, and surely no one uses export ciphers. Well, 8.4% of the top 1 million sites use export ciphers. Um, once again, we fired up ZMAP. We started measuring who supported these export ciphers. Um, and what was even worse was 82% used a single prime. Now remember <laughs> that breaking Diffie-Hellman almost entirely just depends on the prime number you're using, not the individual key exchange. And these servers are going to continually use the same one unless you can figure it otherwise. So just by doing pre-computation once, which took us seven days, uh, we could break 82%, yes, 
Alex Green. How did um, how did everybody agree on the most common prime when you're talking um, about Python? So what happens Who suggested is, this? Uh, when you install a server or whatever, um, you can configure like your Diffie Helm parameters, but most people don't. So the server ships with a default set. Um, we're essentially hard coded into the server. Oh. And so, and we thought this was fine, as Alex said earlier, um, <clears throat> that we didn't realize that breaking Diffie Hellman only depended on the prime. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so for these top two primes, uh, we collaborated with those cryptographers in France, um, Cato NFS people, um, and we did the pre computation on those two primes. And that allowed us to break a single, any instance of Diffie-Hellman using one of those primes um, in under two minutes. Um, and then we have some tricks that essentially make this work in, on, real, on real browsers, because usually a user would notice a two minute delay. Um, but there's some tricks you can do to get around that. Um, but OK, let's be honest. This required a bunch of cryptographers in France. Um, this crazy pre-computation, surely no one is actually exploiting this. So then we asked the obvious follow-up question. Well, it turns out you can do this pre-computation thing. How hard would it be to do a pre-computation on a 1,024-bit prime? Because 1,024-bit primes are used by regular connections. Not all, not all of them, but many do. And if you're using just uh, sort of default settings on Nginx, with, but you turned off export, uh, export ciphers, but didn't set your custom Diffie-Hellman parameters, you're using a 1,024-bit prime. That's pretty much how every web server works. So if you don't change any settings, this is what you use. And what's different about this is now we wouldn't need to do this downgrade thing where we sit in the middle and we lie about the ciphers and we change the hashes. Now we can just decrypt connections whenever we want and whenever we feel like it because people would already be using uh, cryptography that we could break. But, that, but can we is the question. Well, we put our tinfoil hats on and started looking up all of the optimizations and algorithms you could do and tried to uh, extend out how hard would it be to break a 1,024-bit prime. Um, and so, right, so for a 512-bit, we're looking at seven days. Academics can do this. Uh, they tell us we can do a 768-bit prime in about a month. So two months, once again, feasible for academics. Um, extrapolating up, you could break one prime that's 1,024 bits long for about 100 to 300 million dollars over the course of a year. Um, so, yeah, that's not necessarily great. But, let's be honest, that's only one prime. Surely people are using more than one prime. So, once again, we fired up ZMAP to figure out what primes people are using. And this time we didn't limit ourselves to HTTPS. Uh, we also took a look at SSH and we took a look at Ike, which is used by VPM, so the Internet Key Exchange Protocol. Um, and 37% of the top 1 million are using the same 1,024-bit prime, the top prime. And if you look at the top 10, you get over 50%. Um, and if you look at Ike, um, pretty much or two thirds of all connections are using one prime. Um, and guess what? These two primes are the same. They're defined in an RFC, actually. Um, uh, they're called the Oakley groups. Um, so that's still a lot of sort of extrapolation, um, but if we go and look at the things that the NSA said, um, which is to say, we are invest in a, investing in groundbreaking new cryptanalytic capabilities to defeat adversarial cryptography and exploit internet traffic. They said that in 2013. Um, oh, and they also have a $10 billion budget across the entire US government for breaking cryptography. Um, and then if you go and look at some of the stuff that Snowden sent out, um, where they talk about being able to decrypt VPN traffic, and they seem to imply that they can, in fact, do it. <laughs> um, and also that most, uh, a lot of the time, uh, it, they can just do it automatically just from a passive capture. You don't have to do any of this extra stuff like finding the pre-shared key or, or calling up their tailored access operations to go and uh, uh, screw with your Cisco router or something. It just works. Um, that, this is a pre-step to doing any of that stuff. Um, this is all sort of starting to come together as if maybe uh, uh, it was totally feasible for them to have done this pre-computation on, on the most common 1,024-bit prime. Do you see a question over there? Is there a question? Okay. Um, so 
what can we do? Well, actually, one more slide. Um, if you look at their diagrams of how their systems work, uh, they seem to suggest that they essentially send the VPN traffic to some magical CA server. CA, in this case, stands for crypt uh, cryptanalysis server, I believe. Um, crypt it's called cryptanalytic services. Yes, cryptanalytic services, um, where it can do the decryption. And so all of this is sort of fitting together as though maybe uh, uh, 10, 10, 24 bit primes aren't safe anymore. And so, uh, we don't know for sure that they're actually doing this, but it certainly seems within their capability. So, I, I hear they're not very happy about our paper. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, given that only given that only two people threatened to sue you, maybe you should be very pleased that nobody threatened to put you in prison. Uh, we're, we're counting our blessings, yes. <laughs> um. uh, so, what can we do? Well, the obvious thing to do is to stop using uh, this type of Diffie-Hellman, what's called finite field Diffie-Hellman, and start using elliptic curve variants of this. Um, Diffie-Hellman itself is still strong, it still works, as long as you use, you know, large enough keys. We recommend if you're using it, doing it this way, use 2048-bit or higher keys. Um, in the event that you can't do that, for example, you're trying to support Java 6, um, which doesn't do larger than 1024-bit Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve cryptography. Um, I don't think Java 7 does either. I don't remember what the cutoff. Um, generate a new 1024-bit prime. Don't use the one that's shipped with your software by default. Generate your own. You can do this with the OpenSSL command line tool, and you can configure your server to do this. Um, we have instructions on how to do this online. Um, I think the link's on the next slide. And in the more immediate future, Firefox just changed recently and now will reject 512-bit prime numbers um, or 768-bit prime numbers. I think they set the minimum size at 1,024 now. They're going to be sunsetting 1,024 hopefully within the next year or two. Um, we've been working with people at, at Firefox and at Chrome and at Safari, or excuse me, at uh, Internet Explorer and at Safari. Okay, we did get all four. I couldn't remember if Apple talked with us or not. Um, uh, yeah, Apple didn't fix it, but they did talk to us. Um, uh, also, the guy in charge of Apple, uh, of SSL at Apple, his name is Ivan Kristic, who is not to be confused with the guy who runs SSL Labs, who is Ivan Ristic. Um, not really sure who let that happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, and obviously turn export ciphers off. Oh my God, these are leftover from the 90s. And, and if you're developing software, like don't turn them on by default. OpenSSL wasn't more than happy to do this. I think maybe in, not in, in the version, the second latest version, the version that was the latest until today, they might have turned them off by default. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. Um, and so that's all I've got. i um, happy to take more questions now. Um, I'm, uh, this was the stuff about Logjam was done with a lot of people, all of them here at the bottom. Uh, we, as I said earlier, we had 14 co-authors. Um, if you want instructions on how to patch your server or, or use stronger Diffie-Hellman, go to weakdh.org. Um, we've got ZMAP as open source. It's online at zmap.io. Um, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, yes. I was just wondering if uh, some of those kinds of pre-computations pre, uh, pre be applied to elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Um, so elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, essentially the, the upside right now is that the general version of this algorithm just doesn't work on it um, because of the, st the structure of elliptic curves. That's really the reason that they're better um, is because this doesn't work. Um, yes. Peter. <laughs> uh, do they also have a limited set of keys at the, in the elliptic curve implementation? Uh, there's a limited number of curves that people use, but um, yeah, using a small number of curves or a small number of primes isn't necessarily bad or anything. It's as long as you just need to make sure you future-proof them. And well, you need to understand the, the risks. Of the, prime, the selection of the prime is a hard problem, right? I mean, there, you, yes. can, you can do it badly. And it's possible to screw it up, yes. But OpenSSL does do a good job. But if you try to generate a 4096-bit prime, for example, it will take OpenSSL like 20 minutes to do this. Yeah. 
Yeah, the cryptography behind these uh, recommendations is actually kind of subtle because we're talking about um, the sort of the best advice based on what we know in public about elliptic curve and about Diffie-Hellman cryptanalysis. Um, uh, if there are secret algorithmic improvements to this cryptanalysis, then all bets are off. But um, some of the best cryptographers in the world, in the public domain anyway, um, seem to think there probably are not algorithmic improvements. And that's why the attacks we're talking about, this 100 to $300 million, this is basically just brute force um, doing things in hardware at large scale, no algorithmic improvements. Uh, that's part of why it's so uh, convincing and scary. Won't that cost come down over the years, though? Um, yes. Right, so they're going to continue to benefit from Moore's Law. But these standardized primes that uh, David mentioned that are in the RFCs mm -hmm. were defined in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. They've had a lot of time to chew on them. Yes. So what's your opinion on projects like Libre SSL and Boring SSL now that we're seeing all these uh, problems with Open SSL? Um, I don't know much about Libre SSL. We work with the guy who maintains Boring SSL a lot, um, Adam Langley. He's the person we talk with at Chrome. Um, he's definitely one of the smartest people in the field. Um, we actually steal a lot of their code to do stuff. Um, but uh, to, for the scanning and for implementing the, uh, for pulling up the primes and that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, I don't have a strong opinion on any of them. It's good that more people are looking at it though. Um, boring, SS boring SSL has had a better track record recently than open SSL, for example. They weren't vulnerable to the thing that came out today, but they were both vulnerable to freak, so. They reported the thing that came out today, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the methodology and how you figured out the primes were similar across the algorithms. Uh, across the different protocols, you yes, mean? I mean how HTTPS and Ike were using the same yeah, primes, right? Um, so I'm, we literally like we just uh, scanned both of the protocols. We extracted the prime numbers that were used, and we just compared like physically the number, and and the prime number is the same. They both come out of the same RFC. I don't remember what its number is, but it's an RFC just full of prime numbers. Really, it's like hey, you can use these primes. It's written in late '90s, um, back when it was much uh, the computing power required to make some of these primes. Uh, it would have taken a lot more. Like right now, if you're doing a 4,000 bit one, it's still like 20 minutes. In the 90s, that would have been a lot longer. Well, the other subtle thing is that it's possible to pick backdoored primes uh, that are much easier to cryptanalyze. Um, but uh, so that's one reason that these standardized primes that are chosen in uh, uh, a way that makes it look pretty convincing that there's no backdoor are, are good to use. Um, but if you're picking them yourself and you trust you, um, you're okay to pick them yourself. Uh, kind of following up on that one, actually. If your threat model is nation state actor, which would Curl you up in a ball and get drunk <laughs> underneath like a table or something? I'm not well, sure. Sure, yes. Because there are so many other things that can break than this. But, but we but don't need to get just, them any but, easy victory. But saying that's the case, which would you pick? Would you pick elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman with the NIST curves, or would you pick 2048-bit with open um, SSL generated So something? I'm happy to go into the details of this later, but I would still go with the elliptic curves, um, and I can recently explain why um, it relates to, I would go with the elliptic curves still. There's, there's no, so people, there's rampant speculation that the NIST curves are backdoored. No one has proved this. No one actually has any claim to that statement. Why have the curves been backdoored? Um, but the thing that really, what you, ideally you should be using the curves made by the guy who sued the government about export ciphers, Daniel J. Bernstein. He's got one called Curve 2519 and Ed 25519. Um, those are what are largely considered the best curves. They're making their way in the TLS now. There's a draft spec for using them in TLS, um, they're not currently used yet.
Back to the 47% of the people that opened the email and did something? Yes. How many opened it and did nothing? Um, Zakir, do you know? Well, I believe it would be one minus. Well, it had a 47% increase <laughs> in patching. So I'm going to go with, yeah, it probably should be one minus in this case. 53% didn't read it. Um, or didn't open the email. Like we don't have a way to tell as an email sender whether they emailed it or opened it or deleted it. Well, we could have added an image bug or something, but we didn't. Well, <laughs> how did you authenticate who, who you Ooh, were? Sorry. Anyone push back? I'm sorry, how, how did you authenticate who you were and did anybody push back um, and say, hey, are you legit? Uh, so I mean, some people did. Uh, there was at least one case where they were like, this is illegal. And we were like, well, this is the details of how we're doing it. We didn't actually exploit it. You can look at our website, because um, I had a link here, zmapio slash heartbleed. Um, our email came from at umich.edu and was signed by a Berkeley professor and a Michigan professor. So it could have been an elaborate phishing attempt to try to get right. you to patch yeah. your server, but <laughs> that I was where most I was people, going. Yeah. most people believed it, I think, okay. that actually read it. One interesting fact is so uh, we um, scan about 15 protocols on a regular basis with ZMAP. So uh, almost, um, uh, almost every day, everyone with a public IP address gets multiple probes from us. And of course, some fraction of those people notice and think they're under attack or something fishy is going on and complain. <laughs> but the rate has been pretty consistent that it's about one out of every billion probes generates uh, a complaint. Ariana here is uh, on the front line of responding to all of that. So if you want an email from Ariana, just uh, complain about the ZMAP probes you're getting. <laughs> it, when people do, we're happy to just take them off of the list of things that we scan, though. So we're trying to be good neighbors. One more quick advertisement. If you're interested in the data that we're collecting by all of this, and you don't want to run ZMAP yourself, but you'd really like to ask questions about the universe of, say, all HTTPS servers, we publish this data at a website called scans.io. Um, so it's all available if you'd like to do your own research and ask questions about this. I can yell really loud. Now we're recording this. Yeah, yeah, it's for the people online. <laughs> yeah. So after doing all this research, what next? Where are you guys going to take this, you know, go the next step from here? Um, one of the things that we're working on currently is making all this data much more public than it is now. Um, right now, uh, it, we're, we're working on getting more and more of it posted to scans.io in an easier and easier fashion so that more people can take advantage of this. Um, I guess I can let Alex talk about more general directions. Cause well, beyond that, it's classified. Person. You'll have to apply to the PhD program if you want to find <laughs> out. <laughs> But we are interested, we're very, very interested in further improving the security of TLS, particularly um, as a means to protect um, the, uh, the global internet against mass surveillance, right? Despite all these problems with TLS that it's encountered over the past few years, it's still so much better than not encrypting at all. And so for that reason, one of the projects that we're doing is something called Let's Encrypt, which is a new certificate authority that we launched together with EFF and Mozilla that's going to provide free, automatically configured TLS certificates for anyone with a website. Um, and that's going to launch starting in September. So you'll no longer have any excuse not to have TLS turned on. It will be as simple as just app get install, Let's Encrypt. Um, the question is, will that be recognized by the browsers? Yes, it will be recognized by all major browsers from day one when we launch because we're going to be cross-signed by another certificate authority. So how do you bring those to the people that had the 512-bit certificates, though? I mean, it's easy to talk to us and tell us to do, you know, apt-get, install, let's encrypt, but we're, ar we're already the ones that have, like, the long the long bit keys and stuff like that. So how are we going to bring it to the people that, that need it most? Maybe we'll email them. 
<laughs> well, we we did. We know who you are. <laughs> We did post instructions on weekdh.org. We're working with browsers to try and mitigate this so that even if the server is badly maintained, um, right? that's why the browsers are starting to reject these short primes. That's being rolled out like Firefox. Um, if you visit our site right now, you get the nice blue, you're all good. Um, Chrome, it's set to be patched in version 45. Um, Internet Explorer is patched in the one on Windows 10. And possibly already, I think they bumped the minimum up to 768 actually before we disclosed. Um, so if someone who was clever and really paying attention to CVEs might have been realized that something was up, because I think they patched about a week before we disclosed. Um, yeah. Also, part of the vision for Let's Encrypt is that someday soon, maybe in a year or two, when you install Apache or Nginx, this is just going to be a dependency. So we want to, our goal here is to see HTTP go away. Right, that in a few years, people will look back and say, wait, the, most of the world used HTTP without encryption? What, were they crazy? It will be the same way we look at people who use Telnet to log in and enter their root password. <laughs> and we're already even seeing trends in that direction. Like HTTP2 is pretty much entirely only supported over TLS right now. Um, there's talk in Firefox of not implementing new web development features for HTTP requiring HTTPS, that sort of thing. Chrome starting to head in the move, heading in the same direction as well, um, but it's slow. It's progress, but it's slow. Uh, how are you, how are you gonna handle domain validation? I mean, what methodology are you using to prevent me from saying, hey, give me the certificate for google.com? Question, so how do we validate domains with Let's Encrypt? We want it to be automatic and cut the human out of the loop. Well, if you use someone like GoDaddy today, they give you two options, right? You pay them, uh, you know, you pay them 100 bucks or something, and either they'll send an email to some address associated with your domain, like administrator at domain, or you can put up a file with a certain random value they give you on your website, and they'll go and check it. We're going to do the second one. Incidentally, if you send mail to administrator at umish.edu, it gets redirected to me. <laughs> you can create whatever directory group you want, as long as it's greater than a certain number of characters. So uh, some of these are fairly sophisticated uh, things to find, but uh, Heartbleed was, was particularly simple. So are you doing anything in the way of uh, actually researching just simple bugs and code, fuzzing, what have you here at U of M? We don't do much fuzzing or bug hunting or direct sort of bug hunting and implementations in our lab. Um, we do try to work with uh, a lot of these bugs sort of been coming out of Adam Langley and other people at Google. We try to work with them whenever we can to sort of do scanning type stuff ahead of time to figure out what is the impact, um, how can we fix this better. Um, but we don't do a lot of sort of fuzzing or implementation hunting ourselves. Uh, There's a, a great paper on uh, fuzzing TLS uh, security next month, Eustix security. Yes, at the security conference in DC next month, I believe there's something that does exactly that. <laughs> I think it's been an hour. Thank you so much for uh, presenting, David. Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, I think I, and thank you also to Dr. Alex Halderman for standing in for Dr. John Oberheide tonight. And thank you very much to Duo Security. Um, really, it's one of the great pleasures of being in Ann Arbor to have the university and this community of uh, wonderful uh, startups like Duo uh, in, under the same uh, town and umbrella. So thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, well, all right. All right, just a quick quick round of community announcements. So, uh, so again, this is an event that we do every month. Uh, coming up next month, we actually have another university speaker, um, Dr. Paul Resnick, actually from the U of M's uh, School of Information, presenting on, uh, it's a little bit different topic, uh, rumor lens, um, looking at the um, impact of rumors and corrections in social media. So a little bit of a different topic. Um, and coming up also, just to put on your radar, is, um, is a security conference that we're holding uh, coming up in uh, September 
If you go to arbsec.org, arbsec is another security meetup that happens monthly here, first Wednesday of every month, more of a drink up. Um, but uh, Chris Zub from Duo and uh, Mark Stanislav from Rapid7 and uh, Zach Lanier from uh, Acuvant, all here in Ann Arbor, uh, are organizing this um, in the, uh, the, I think the basement or downstairs in Bonar Sera uh, in sep uh, September. 12th of September. 12th of September. So check out arbsec.org for more details. Um, there's an open CFP right now for presentations um, and so forth. And um, 20 bucks to get lunch and t-shirts. <laughs> All righty. Any other community announcements today? No? We are hiring a duo. We are, we are always hiring a duo, um, and we are growing very quickly. And um, again, if you have any questions about that, find one of us wearing a, a green uh, sweatshirt or a, I guess a green name tag. Um, and with that, I think uh, we'll adjourn. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. In a somewhat similar vein, uh, crypto parties happening again this month for anyone interested. It's at uh, All Hands Active this Saturday at 4 p.m. So come to teach stuff, teach what you know, learn something you don't in general. Um, also, uh, I'm starting a uh, coding program at Neutral Zone, and we're looking for people that might be interested in volunteering. Um, I'm also going to school and working, so during the fall I'll be super busy, so we're looking for other people that might be interested in kind of going there and mentoring kids as they create apps and things like that. So if anyone is interested, then they can get a hold of me. Uh, I'll be here for a little bit, and I can tell you all about it. Google is doing a tech night in combination with the AFC Ann Arbor Soccer Club. It's a free event. I think it's Saturday at 2.30. Um, I guess Google it or you can email me, um, Colleen at cybertalentsearch.com or whatever, but I think it's going to be a great fun event. Yeah, it's, it's a lo local soccer and uh, Google will be sponsoring all the food and, and drinks and tailgate basically for, for basically a big soccer game on the weekend. Any other announcements for today? All right, great. Well, please join us upstairs, eat our pizza, drink our beer, have fun. We'll see you next time.